Well, good morning. Have my microphone on, hopefully. Yes. Well, thank you, Steve. We appreciate um, singing those songs here this morning. At the end of uh, the message this morning, we do have a few people who will be coming for baptism this morning, and Pastor Steve will be uh, conducting the uh, baptism afterwards. I feel a little funny because the uh, pulpit's been moved forward, and uh, I have the feeling it's just going to kind of go that way. Um, they told me not to back up too far because I'll hit the microphone and then fall into the baptismal tank, which I fully understand, but I'm really not worried about that. I'm actually worried more about the, the, the wood behind me and just falling over that. So if something weird happens today, I've just given you just a little disclaimer here uh, right at the get-go uh, here this morning. Well, this morning's message, we're in Mark chapter 6. If you want to take your Bibles and uh, turn to Mark chapter 6, uh, this is where we'll be residing here this morning. Uh, and as you're turning there, let me ask you this question. Isn't it funny how uh, easy it is to get known for something? Uh, they talk about Hollywood and they talk about actors and actresses. If you're an actor and you're always in an action movie, they figure that you're kind of stereotyped and that's all you're going to be doing. Uh, maybe you're always a bad guy. And there are all those bad guys in the movies, right? And it always surprises me when someone who's always a bad guy gets a role as a good guy. Because you're kind of like, whoa, that really doesn't fit. And the whole time I'm looking at that person thinking, I bet you they're really a bad guy. And it, it's really funny because we stereotype things that way, and it's, it's just very, very common for us. Well, there's a, there's a woman who's running for office down in Florida, and she's really concerned that some of the things in her life will become uh, more of a nuisance and kind of overshadow who she is and how wonderful she is for the role as, I think, a U.S. candidate for the House of Representatives. Um, and she's been endorsed by a big newspaper in Miami. The Miami Herald has endorsed her. And she's really concerned, though. She's grateful for the endorsement, but she doesn't want her story of being kidnapped by aliens to define her. <laughs> and I can't even make this up. It, it has nothing to do, she says, with what I've done. It happened when I was seven years old, and I'm so proud of the newspaper for endorsing me. And I'm thinking, what in the world? Um, but she was uh, allegedly, she alleges she was taken aboard a spaceship as a young girl by blonde extraterrestrials who resemble the Christ, the Redeemer statue in Rio de Janeiro. Yeah, I mean, I see those people around, but I just didn't know that. Um, <laughs> she says that they told her the center of the world's energy is in Africa and that there's a cave in Malta that's got thousands of non-human skulls in it. And she believes that. And, and, you know, I guess if that just, like, happened, like, randomly to you, you know, you might get over it. But she's been telepathically connected to these people since she was 17 years old. But she just doesn't want to be defined by this, you know. She wants to be seen as a legitimate uh, contender for U.S. House of Representatives. If she gets elected, I'm moving, okay? In a real sense, we like to be known for certain things in our life. And one of the things that's so fascinating is how our culture today loves to be known for its busyness. We love to be known for our busyness. Do you realize that it wasn't all that long ago that if you were a wealthy person, you'd like to be known not for your busyness, but for the fact that you had leisure time to burn. You didn't work a million hours a week, but our society today has taken on a new definition of success, and our success is really based upon how busy we are. So when people ask us, you know, how busy are you, or how's it going, and you say, I'm busy, it says something about you. There are a lot of articles, there are a lot of good articles online that you could read about this phenomenon, but... The fact that we live in a time where, as one friend of mine who I say, well, how's it going? He always says this. He says, I'm crazy busy. I'm doing great, but I'm crazy busy. Mary Tyler Moore, if you didn't know who the woman was in there, dating myself. Um, but there she is on her typewriter phone. She's got a million different things going on. Today, we pride ourselves as Americans in being crazy busy while the rest of the world thinks we're just crazy. 
You see, the problem is that we sometimes try to become really, really important through our busyness. It's become a status symbol. If you're not busy, it infers that you're maybe not that important. You are much more successful because you're in such demand. And so the sidelines of that is we meet people who are crazy busy, and what they're trying to say is, I have no time for anything else in my life. I can't possibly inject anything more into my life because my life is so full already, I couldn't possibly help you out. Now here we are as believers, followers of Jesus Christ, and we're challenged by the whole issue of serving Jesus Christ by serving others. And here's where the whole story picks up here in Mark chapter 6. You may recall in verse 7, the disciples are sent out, the 12 disciples are sent out two by two into the villages to preach the gospel. So they go out, Jesus has given them very specific orders of what they're supposed to do and not do, and they go out and they are on this kind of an evangelistic short-term missions trip. They go out into the villages and they convey the gospel of Jesus Christ, calling people to throw off their self-righteousness and see their need for a Savior, and they're pointing all the while to Jesus, saying, He is the Messiah, He is the true Savior. By the time you get to verse 30, the missions trip is done. They've come back to Jesus, and the Bible says the, the, the apostles gather together with Jesus, and they're reporting to Him, all that has been done, and all the things that basically they said. And Jesus comes to them and says, come away by yourselves to a secluded place and rest a while. You see, the problem was never that Jesus didn't attract people. People were always attracted to Jesus. Jesus was doing miracles. They were excited by his healing. And so from the very beginning in the first chapter of Mark, we're introduced to these crowds of people who are pressing into the home, trying to listen, trying to be healed, whatever the needs were. And Jesus has continued to do that ministry while the apostles are out on their missions trip. When they come back, the apostles are no doubt excited about getting Jesus' ear on this and reporting to Jesus everything that's gone on. And no doubt, Jesus wants to hear about it all. But they are so inundated with this crowd of people that it has become impossible to do this. In fact, uh, the parentheses here after that statement by Jesus in my Bible, it says, for there were many people coming and going and they did not even have time to eat. I don't know about you, but when you don't have time to eat, you don't have much time, right? I mean, we live in a fast food generation. You mean you whip through. I, I drove through Chick-fil-A yesterday, and I'm telling you what, it's amazing. I drive through Chick-fil-A, got a large lemonade and one of those frosted lemonades besides, and I mean, I'm tooling them up. And uh, when, I, when I got through, the lady says, listen, I'm really sorry for the wait. And I looked at her and I said, you don't need to be sorry. It was like four minutes, okay? Four, you know, it's like, wow. When you don't have time to eat, you don't have time. So Jesus says to the disciples, we're going to get in the boat and we're going to go around the Sea of Galilee and we're going to go to a remote area where we can talk. You can report to me everything that's going on and yeah, you'll get something to eat. So the disciples, food is important. How many here, food's important? That's the rough thing about the second service. You guys are already locked in <laughs> on lunch, okay? First service, not so much. I could say to them this morning, I said, you know, it's quarter to 10. And it's like, well, you had your breakfast and you're not hungry for lunch. And if you are, there's probably something to eat in the foyer. And uh, you're sitting there going, oh, rats, I should have got something in the foyer because I'm really hungry right now, right? Uh, yes, so food is important. Here's the issue. The people, verse 33, saw them going Many recognized them, and they ran together on foot from all the cities, and they got there ahead of them. This is the problem when you're navigating a pond, right? I mean, it's only eight miles across. They can see you, and they can anticipate where you're going. So this horde of people are running around the edge of the Sea of Galilee, anticipating where they're going to get out of the boat, and they are there waiting for them when Jesus shows up. So much for eating, and so much for telling Jesus all about what's gone on. 
This is, this is the definition of crazy busy, right? I mean, this is super, super busy. And ministry is not stopping, as we'll see. And what I want to show you this morning is the reaction of Jesus to these thousands of people and contrast the reaction of Jesus to the reaction of the disciples because they're very different. And it challenges us to a point here this morning where we need to make decisions even in our own lives. But let's look to the Lord first, shall we? God, we just come before you and thank you for the testimony of our dear Savior, Jesus Christ, who pushed all things aside and was focused on the needs of those around him. Father, we're so struck by the love of our Savior, by his dedication, by the mission that he was on. Father, help our hearts to be challenged today from this passage of Scripture. And as we analyze this passage, Father, help us to see and understand the significant need to react as Jesus reacted, that we might truly glorify our Savior who's called us to service. We pray this all in Christ's name now. Amen. So when we stop and we look at the reaction of Jesus, I want to show you here in this passage, if you look in your Bible uh, to this passage, you see that when Jesus went ashore, he literally got out of the boat and went ashore. Jesus doesn't stop the boat, it's interesting here, uh, along the shoreline and teach as he did in Capernaum. Instead, Jesus comes out of the boat, sees them all coming, and he steps right into that large crowd. And the Bible tells us the reasoning behind that. There is a reaction that Jesus has, and it's twofold, I believe. One is there's an emotional reaction to these people. Not only is there a, an emotional reaction, but there's a spiritual reaction. But first, the emotional reaction. The Bible says he saw a large crowd and he felt compassion for them. The word compassion is a fascinating word. You might have heard this described before, but uh, it was thought that the bowels of a person down deep inside your abdomen were the seat of all of your emotions, your intellect, and your will. There was so much to this term that when Jesus is there and he sees these people, he is overwhelmed by them. It doesn't say his heart, doesn't say his mind. This was not the terminology. Here the terminology is speaking to the depth of compassion that Jesus had. In other words, out of everything that is Jesus, he is looking at this group of people and he is filled with love towards them because he recognizes that they have a unique set of needs. And he's looking at them from the standpoint of one who can meet those needs. Remember, there's a, a whole bunch of needs here. After all, this is the passage where Jesus is the, doing the feeding, and it's the feeding of the 5,000. We know that there's the need of food, not only from the disciples' standpoint, but also the masses are going to eat, need to eat as well. But there's also a spiritual need. And Jesus sees that. And out of looking at these people, he sees them as people who have these needs. And he wants those needs to be met. And you see the compassion of Jesus. The emotional reaction is clear, but then spiritually there's a reaction as well. Notice what he says secondly. He said he was feeling this compassion because, and here's the reason. He says they were like sheep without a shepherd. That was a huge problem. Now, everyone in this time period, in Jesus' day, would understand illustrations that pertain to sheep, right? I mean, we have a picture over there. I just noticed that. There's some sheep on the wall. That's good. That's fitting. I'm glad somebody put that there this week. Jesus looks at them and says, you're sheep. You're like sheep and you have no shepherd. Now, if you were a sheep, you might really have appreciated your shepherd because your shepherd would keep you safe. He would watch over you. He wouldn't lead you to a place of danger. He would lead you away from danger. He would make certain that you were in a good place to eat. And so he'd take you to nice pasture land where you could fill yourself up eating what you needed to eat. You see, the shepherd was always watching out for the interest of the sheep. Sheep without a shepherd would wander off into places where there might be wolves or there might be other things that would eat them up for lunch. The Old Testament is full of examples of Israel being described as a flock of sheep 
without any shepherd. You see, the religious leaders who were there were supposed to be guiding the people of Israel. They were supposed to be guiding them in areas of morality and areas of the law. And, and uh, they were just doing a very, very poor job of that. And so oftentimes God would use the prophets to explain to the, to the people that you are like sheep without a spiritual shepherd. You see, they were like people that had no compass, even morally trying to figure it out. It was a dangerous place to be. Compasses are important, aren't they? We want to know which direction we're going. Without a spiritual compass, these people were lost. And that's what Jesus sees. He sees people without uh, an idea. What are they supposed to put their, their faith in? What are they supposed to live for? What was the uh, significance of their lives? All of these were questions that these people didn't have answers for. They were lacking that compass. And when I use an illustration of a compass, I realize that most of you don't have compasses like we used to have compasses. How many of you have a compass, like a real compass? A bunch of you do. That's cool. Most of you don't. That's cool, too. Why would we need a compass when we have our cell phone, right? How about it? It is like the Swiss Army knife of electronics. It has flashlights built in. It has apps galore. And I'm telling you right now, I got a compass on my cell phone. I don't trust it, but I have it. And uh, you, you see, the, the issue, I shouldn't say, you know, what are you going to do without a compass? The better question is, what would you do without your cell phone, right? Jesus is looking at this crowd and he says, man, you guys are like 2019 U.S., no cell phones. <laughs> you, you have nothing to guide you. You have no shepherd. You don't have that GPS. What would we do without our cell phones? We plug in an address that tells us turn by turn how to get there. I mean, if we didn't have that, what would we do? Spiritually, what are these people going to do? You see, Jesus is looking at them and he's saying, they have no direction. And Jesus couldn't walk away from that. Because here are these people standing in front of him with a tremendous, tremendous need. So the Bible says the reaction of Jesus was that he began to teach them many things. He says, I'm going to teach you. You, you, need, you need to have some direction. You need to know what to believe in and whom to believe in. And in this case, Jesus could say, I am the bread of life. I am the one who is come. I am the Messiah. I am the Savior of the world. I've come to take upon myself the sins of the world so that fallen, unredeemed sinners can have their sin forgiven and have a relationship with God the Father through me. You see, that was the gospel. And that's what these people needed to hear. It must have been amazing to be sitting there and listening to Jesus explain this. You've listened to pastor after pastor and teacher after teacher explain this from an earthly perspective. Wouldn't it have been amazing for us to be able to sit there and hear Jesus do it right? Right? I mean, it's just amazing with such authority and such clear presentation. See, these people had a need, and Jesus saw that need. Now, let's notice the second point here, which is the reaction of the disciples. Uh, to the need of the masses. Because the Bible says that as Jesus is teaching, it had become quite late, verse 35. And his disciples came to him. Now, I would not have wanted to be one of the disciples that went up and interrupted Jesus while he was teaching, would you? And stop and think about it. Hey, Peter, you do it, right? And Peter's like, I'm not doing it. He's like, okay, let's draw straws. Um, but someone went up to him, maybe two or three of them went up to Jesus and said, <clears throat> excuse me, excuse me, like the Son of God doesn't know what time it is. It's getting late. And, and what they were really saying was what? We're hungry. We haven't eaten. We did this missions trip. We just got back, and you don't have time to hear from us, and you do not have time to even eat with us. I thought that was the whole point of rowing all those miles. And the disciples come to Jesus. They say, it's already late, and there's no, there's no restaurants here. That's what he means when he says this place is desolate. I'm sure that was the whole point in Jesus is taking them there because it was desolate. 
They wanted to get away from the crowds, but Jesus in his wisdom already knew that was going to happen. They said uh, to Jesus, it's already quite late. Let's send them away so they can go into the countryside and the villages and buy themselves something to eat. You know, let them go find their own place to get something to eat. Jesus, it's already late. It's getting dark. And we all need to eat. Send these people away was the reaction of the disciples. Now, the reaction of the disciples is very, very different, wouldn't you say, from that of Jesus, who from his innermost being saw the people and saw their need and was moved by compassion. I don't see the disciples as being moved by compassion. I see the disciples saying, okay, enough is enough. Let's get some rest and let's get something to eat. Send these people away. Let them fend for themselves and get the food. Hey, nobody asked them to walk all the way over here. Where's our obligation to have to feed them? And so this is their reaction, which I'm afraid is all too more closely aligned with our reactions than with Jesus' reaction. And Jesus feeling sympathy for them, (laughs) looks at them and says, you give them something to eat. They didn't have anything to give. And they said, shall we go and spend 200 denarii on bread? I believe Philip said this, and, and give them something to eat. That's about eight months worth of wages. Even if we had the money, how would we possibly feed these people. I mean, how is that going to be done? So the disciples have an emotional reaction. They're fatigued. Uh, they're tired. Uh, they're not interested in doing this. I remember the, the old uh, acronym HALT, H-A-L-T. I remember an evangelistic group coming through our church and saying, we're oftentimes tempted to sin when these things are present. Uh, H, you'll never guess what H stands for. It stands for Hungry, that's right. And A stands for angry. And they're mad because they wanted time with Jesus. And so they're ticked off besides. So they're hungry, they're tired. One thing they're not is lonely. But the, well, the third out of the four is they're tired. They're tired. They're exhausted. And I would say Jesus is also hungry. Jesus is also tired. But Jesus is willing to minister even in the midst of that something that they were not willing to do. Their spiritual reaction causes us to have a concern. Because while Jesus looked at the multitudes as being like sheep without a shepherd, they looked at it and they were saying, what did they say exactly? Oh, let's look back at that. He says, send them away. Scatter them. Almost like a a wolf would come in and scatter a flock of sheep. Let them go and scatter. Let them, let them take off. Let them fend for themselves. And instead, Jesus looks at them and Jesus says, no, you feed them. And they wondered how they could possibly do that. Now, on the one hand, you could make an argument that this is about faith. They were lacking faith. And that much is true. But I don't think that's the main point. In fact, this message today is part one of part two. Next week, we'll be looking at what exactly follows on the heels of this, because I think it illustrates for us very clearly that this is about the needs of others. So the disciples asked the question, what are we going to do about it? Now, people estimate that there were thousands upon thousands of people here to feed. The Bible records that there were 5,000 men present, and they often counted men and left the women and the children out of the official count. So let's say that there were 5,000 men. That's a lot of men to feed, isn't it? I wouldn't want to have to try to do that physically without a miracle. I mean, if we took 5,000 men right now, we took their wives and their children, and we put them all in the Naval Academy football stadium, and we filled it all up, and I took 12 of the best of you and said, okay, you've got a half an hour to feed these people. What would you do? Well, you'd get on your smartphone right away, and you'd get your charge card burning, and you'd start to order food. And you would order as much food as you can from as many places as you can, because after all, and listen, the bottom line is, if you were able to pull that off, I would put that in the miracle category, just saying. 
How are we going to feed these thousands upon thousands of people, reasonably speaking? And the answer is, we can't do it in a reasonable way. But with Jesus, we see anything is possible. You remember the story about the lad who had the bread and the two fish? The Bible says that after he asked this question, he said to them, how many loaves do you have? And so we have the interweaving here of a couple other uh, things that are going on. We have a boy there who's got five bread loaves. And they're not like supersized bread loaves that you'd buy at the grocery store. There were like five pieces of flat bread. That's it. That's what they were. And there were two fish. And we're not talking a thousand pound tuna fish here that we could somehow sushi out and feed 5,000 people. We're talking about two pickled little like anchovies. And you basically made a sandwich and that was this little kid's lunch. And the Bible says that Jesus commanded everyone to sit down in groups on the green grass. They sat down in hundreds and fifties and he took the five loaves, the two fish, and he blessed the food and he broke the loaves and he kept giving to the disciples to set before them. And he divided the two fish among them all. So Jesus is standing there. There's five little things of bread. There's two little pickled fish. And he begins breaking them out and handing them to the disciples. And it keeps going and going and going. And the disciples start to hand it out to these groups of 50s and 100. So you got a 50 group here, you got a 100 group here, 50 group over there, and it's like, okay, did everybody get their food? Yes, everybody get your food here? Yes, okay. So in Jesus is feeding them, and the disciples are probably wondering to themselves, what in the world is going on? Why doesn't this stuff just, I mean, evaporate? But it never did. Jesus kept giving it and giving it and giving it and giving it. What a miracle was wrought that day when thousands upon thousands of people are fed in a miraculous way. Spurgeon said this, he said, he it was who thought of the way of feeding them. It was a design invented and originated by himself. His followers had looked at their little store of bread and fish and given up the task as hopeless. But Jesus altogether unembarrassed and in no perplexity had already considered how he would bank with the thousands and make the fainting sing for joy. Isn't that great? Jesus had it all figured out. And he doesn't stop there. We have some descriptions here that are really pretty neat. Notice what he says here that after they had eaten, verse 42 says, they all ate. All these thousands of people, they all ate. There was no one that said, hey, I didn't get mine. Every single person was fed. And the Bible says they all ate and were satisfied. They were satisfied. That word satisfied is a neat word because that word satisfied was used uh, when you were feeding animals. Now, I got to say this. Most dogs I know never know that they're full. They'll eat until they, you know what I mean, they get sick. But other animals are a little smarter, I think, and they don't eat quite as to such a degree. But they'll eat until they're satisfied. And this is actually a term that was used in animal husbandry where the farmer could say that the animals have been satisfied. And so they ate enough and they were pleasantly satisfied. It, it wasn't like you were, have you ever gone to a French restaurant? You ever, you ever done that? I took a, a, a date to a French restaurant one time and uh, they gave us like the food and the food was like this big around. And I mean, I'm, I'm wanting something a little bit more significant than that. And it cost a fortune, and I had to put my nickels together so we could get to McDonald's after we left there and get a Big Mac and a milkshake. You know what I'm saying? So, so the whole thing is, these people were able to eat until they were pleasantly satisfied. They had had enough food, and they were absolutely satisfied to the point where there was no need for any more. I mean, I could see these guys getting up and kind of stretching their robes a little bit, going, whoo, <laughs> that was a great meal. The point is, Jesus is able to satisfy our needs. And he does that on a physical level, but more importantly, he does it spiritually. You see, Jesus is the bread of life. And faith in Jesus Christ will bring us satisfaction in life. One of the biggest problems we face is if we don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, we live this life without any satisfaction. 
there's no purpose really to it. We're trying to, to struggle through the whys and wherefores, but we're recognizing that, you know, uh, I'm really not satisfied with my life. If my life is all about material things, then the material things just don't seem to satisfy me, and why don't they? I don't understand. If my life is all about family, when I'm disappointed, what should I be doing? I'm not satisfied with that either. The only thing that brings satisfaction to a human being is when we have a personal, vibrant relationship with Jesus Christ. He is our Savior. He is our purpose for living, and He is the one we seek to glorify. And truly, that is what God brings to every single follower of his. You see, Jesus alone is the one who's able to feed the masses. Jesus alone is the one who satisfies not only our physical being, but more importantly, our spiritual being. So the reaction of Jesus was well-founded when he had compassion, when he recognized these people's needs, and he looked at their physical need and said, well, we'll meet the physical need. It's getting late. But more importantly, Jesus was teaching them that he was there to meet their spiritual need. Now the question that remains is, how do you and I react? How do you and I react to ministry opportunities and the needs of others that are in front of us? That's a valuable question to ask, isn't it? You see, we talk oftentimes about being the hands and feet for Jesus. We're called upon to be the hands and feet. But we're also called upon to be the heart of Jesus as well towards those who have needs. Going back to the original thought, which was on the subject of busyness, are we too busy to see the needs of others? Are we too busy to look around and say, wow, this, this person has a need, but I'm crazy busy. There's no way I can do anything. Or do we stop and take the time to do the ministry that God has called us to do? The funny thing is, all of us have had huge needs in the past. And we've always been really thankful that Christ was there to meet those needs. Aren't you thankful that, as the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, aren't you glad that when you placed that call, he didn't put you on hold? Aren't you glad that he didn't say, well, our business hours are Monday, 9 a.m., please call back, and uh, we'll be happy to service your call. When you had a deep concern and you went to the Lord in prayer, aren't you thankful that God didn't say, I really don't have time right now for you? As his hands and his feet and his heart, how are we as his ambassadors any different than he is. Opportunities seem to come up. They just come up at the wrong time. We're so, we have so much to do. How am I ever going to deal with that? How am I ever going to, to help that person? I've got a three o'clock, I can't do it. You see, Jesus is teaching the disciples something here of great importance. He is instructing them about the needs of others and how they need to see ministry because there are times when they're going to have to put their own needs aside. Go back to this passage just for a minute more, would you? The Bible says that they all ate and were satisfied. Verse 43 says, they picked up 12 full baskets of broken pieces. 12 full baskets. And also fish. So as they went around, they were gathering up the things that were left over. And you'll never guess what happens. But they gather up 12 whole baskets full. Now I'm thinking to myself, what's behind the number 12? And the first thing that pops into my mind is, oh, there were 12 tribes of Israel. And it has nothing to do with that. There are 12 disciples, and they were what? Hungry. You see, Jesus was going to take care of them. They got their own baskets, full baskets. 
They were going to be able to eat all that they needed. Jesus hadn't forgotten about their needs. It was just a question of, there's someone here in front of me who has a greater need, and let's meet that need because it's a spiritual need, and then your needs will be met. We need to all remember how significant it is for us to do the will of the Lord and allow God to supply our needs because he knows what our needs are, doesn't he? He knew those 12 disciples were hungry. He knew it. He knew it all along. But he was teaching them something that was going to be of vital importance because they were going to be the pillars of the church. Peter, James, and John were going to be so significant in the plans of Almighty God, and they were going to have to to be Christ's hands and feet and heart. And I must tell you that Peter, James, and John are no longer walking the earth. But God is calling on us to be his hands, his heart, and his feet today. Are you willing to serve the Lord? Are you willing to put your needs behind those who have great needs in front of you? Or are you just too busy? Let's pray. This morning, let's just take a moment... And let's look to the Lord and ask some serious questions of ourselves. Perhaps you're here this morning and you recognize a spiritual need in your life. You're looking at your life and you realize that you're you're not really satisfied. You realize that there are gaps. This morning, let me encourage you to place your faith in Jesus Christ and know what it means to be truly satisfied because only he can meet those needs. The Bible tells us very clearly that if we call on his name, placing our faith in Jesus Christ and him alone, that he is faithful to save us from the consequence of our sin. The Bible is very clear on that. That's the whole plan that God had laid out. If you're here this morning and you've never called on Jesus' name for salvation, let me urge you today not to, to, to mix faith in Christ and something else, but just put your total faith in Jesus Christ because good works will not get you closer to heaven. The Bible is very clear on that. It is only the perfect person of Jesus Christ who died in our place and took upon himself our sin who is able to wash away our sin. And faith in him will do that. Perhaps you're here this morning and God's challenged your heart today because you recognize the reality that you are a busy person. And maybe God's challenging you about how busy is too busy. Are you too busy to see the needs of others? It's a fair question to ask. If God's working in your heart today, I pray that you'll follow through and follow his leading that you might bring glory to him. Father in heaven, we do thank you. We praise you, Lord. We praise you all day long for who you are. We thank you that our Jesus saw the tremendous need and didn't shrink back, but was willing to meet that need was willing to set himself aside and endure the pain of the cross. Father, not many would ever do that. But we thank you for the love of Jesus. Help those who are here today who have yet to place their faith in Jesus to see their great need and to follow through with that faith. For others, Lord, we pray, that have already put their faith in Jesus. May our hearts be challenged, Lord, and may our reaction to those who have needs around us be as Jesus' reaction was. May we be moved with compassion towards those who have needs. We pray all of this now in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.
So no, baptism doesn't save anyone. Only faith in Jesus Christ will save. They're all standing in the corner wondering if they should come out. Come on out and go into the room, you're fine. All right, so why are these seven being baptized if it isn't about salvation? Well, we all know that reading the Bible regularly, praying daily, attending local church, these are all very important things that don't save us either, and yet God, uh, Christ commanded those. And in the same way, Jesus Christ commanded that each one of his disciples be baptized. So to not be baptized is really a decision to walk in disobedience. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20 says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. So what is baptism? If it isn't salvation, it's, uh, it is about obedience, but it is also about identification. When a believer is baptized, they publicly identify with Jesus and other Christians. And to identify with something, somebody is to say that you are with that person, that you belong together. And that's what's happening here in this identification. Baptism is also a symbol. We see symbols all the time, uh, school crossings, yield signs, sports teams, locals, things like that. And symbols represent something. And baptism is a physical picture of a spiritual reality that is happening. It is a picture of what Jesus did when he took the punishment for our sins. When you go under the water, it shows people that you believe that Jesus died for you. And when you come up out of the water, you show others that you believe God brought Christ back to life. So when you see someone being baptized, you're watching a movie picture, really, of what has happened to that person spiritually. Baptism is a picture of our death. The person being baptized goes underwater, which is a picture of the burial of our old self that was enslaved to sin. We are as dead to sin as Jesus was dead on the cross. Jesus really did die on the cross. They buried him. And when we put our trust in Christ to save us, God wor God's word assures us that we really died to our sin and our old self was buried along with Jesus. Baptism is also a picture of the resurrection. The person being baptized is brought out of the water. We promised that. There are a lot of parents in here that said, and no, it's true. It's a picture of them being raised up from spiritual death to eternal life. So we go to a lot of trouble of having water and a pool in here. Uh, wh why do we baptize by immersion? And this morning we have a really great example of the importance of baptism by immersion. Katie Reyes, who will be baptized this morning, was saved as a young teen. She wanted to follow Christ and she wanted to follow him in baptism. The church she attended at that time practiced sprinkling, and so she was sprinkled many years ago. She's grown in her walk, she's matured as a, as a believer, and she was sprinkled. So is that baptism? Isn't her heart attitude more important than the method that we are using? Well, it is very important, no question about it. It would really be meaningless to be baptized by immersion if your heart wasn't right with God. On the other hand, God very carefully inspired every word of scripture. The Greek New Testament consistently uses this word, baptizo. It's clearly a word that means to place into, to dip, to plunge down. So baptism shows identification with Jesus Christ in his death, his burial, and then his resurrection. Romans chapter six, verse three and four says, don't you know that as many of, as, of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death, Therefore, as we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And that specific kind of identification is impossible to show with sprinkling or pouring. So without immersion, we really don't have baptizo. We don't have baptism. Well, after studying and thinking through that, Katie has decided that she wants to demonstrate her obedience to every word that was inspired by the word of God. And so this morning she will be baptized. Well, we have David and Thomas Froby, Gabriel and Lucas Duran, Eli Short, and James and Katie Reyes. They're all demonstrating that they have accepted the forgiveness for their sins, bought and paid for by Jesus Christ on the cross. They put their faith in him alone for salvation and the consequence of their sin. But secondly, they're also declaring publicly to us all that they have taken this step of faith and they want everyone who cares to listen and see that they are identifying themselves as followers of Jesus Christ. They are saying to anyone who will listen, I am his 
and he is mine. Right, if I could have David Froby come on down here. Hey, buddy. All right, it isn't just you, okay? I just didn't do it. I just got back from, this, from Michigan and it's very cold water up there. You're good, you're good. Okay, take a deep breath, all right. David Froby, upon your profession of faith in Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of your sin, I baptize you in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. You're good. You're good. All right. Thomas, if you could come on down here. It is a little bit chilly. The heater doesn't work. Oh. There you go, buddy. All right, you'll be all right. You'll be all right. Hands, hands across the chest there. All right. Thomas Froby, upon your profession of faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, I baptize you in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Gabriel. Gabriel Duran, Gabriel, there we go. Hi, buddy. Come on in. <laughs> there we go. Well, Gabriel, upon your profession of faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lucas says, it's my turn, it's my turn. <laughs> All right, turn this way. Lucas Duran, upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sin, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right, Eli. You know what? All right, come on in here. You're good. Come on, come on in here. We're good. No, you're good. Come on in. Oh, yeah. We do need to take the glasses off. Come on, anybody. <laughs> Have to look at that picture, don't we? <laughs> uh, there we go. Good job. Woo! We're all excited for you. <laughs> all right. Eli, upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then uh, James, James Reyes. As James' mother talked about her decision, he got all excited and decided, man, this is something for me too. All right, brother. James Reyes, upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sin, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Come on in, Katie. Not too bad if you compare it to the Lake Superior, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Cross your hands, very, very good. 
Katie Reyes, upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, we've uh, had these individuals have made some significant decisions here this, uh, this last week and before that. Um, if you would like to talk to someone about spiritual things, members of our prayer and care team will be down front here at the conclusion of the service, which will happen right now. So let's stand together, please. And I'm, I apologize for being way down below you here. <laughs> this is a little odd, <laughs> but I'm not stepping out. All right. So may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And may God continue to equip us all as we live out this week as examples of being obedient to Christ in our neighborhoods and in our workplaces. Amen. God bless you all.